Hello, hello. Morning, everybody. The blue shift. Are you ready for the blue shift? I want to read something to you to put you in the right frame of mind for this conversation. It's a scenario, an election night scenario that could very well come true. It'll take me two or three minutes to read this, but I think it's really compelling. So give a listen. It'll also help me warm up my pipes for my television show in 90 minutes. It's election night 2020. This time, all eyes are on Pennsylvania, as whoever wins the Keystone State will win an Electoral College majority. Trump is ahead in the state by 20,000 votes, and he's tweeting, the race is over. Another four years to keep making America great again. The Associated Press, the AP, and the networks have not yet declared Trump a winner, Although 20,000 is a sizable lead, they've learned in recent years that numbers can shift before final official certification of election results. They're afraid of calling the election for Trump, only to find themselves needing to retract the call as they embarrassingly did 20 years earlier in the year 2000. Trump's Democratic opponent, Joe Biden, is not conceding, claiming the race is still too close to call. Both candidates end the night without going in front of the cameras. In the morning, new numbers show that Trump's lead is starting to slip. By noon, it's below 20,000. Impatient, Trump holds impromptu press conferences, and he announces, quote, I've won re-election. The results last night showed that I won Pennsylvania by over 20,000 votes. Those results were complete with 100% of precincts reporting. As far as I'm concerned, those results are now final. I'm not going to let machine politicians in Philadelphia steal my re-election victory from me or from my voters. Despite Trump's protestations, the normal process of canvassing election returns continues in Pennsylvania, and updated returns continue to show Trump's lead slipping away. First, it drops below 15,000, then 10,000, then 5,000. As this happens, Trump tweets become increasingly incensed and incendiary. Stop this theft right now. Don't let them steal this election from you. Protesters take to the streets in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. So far, the demonstrations, while rancorous, have remained nonviolent. Amid police protection, the canvassing process in Pennsylvania has continued, and Trump's lead in the state diminishes even further. Then, several days later, the lead flips. Now, Biden is ahead in Pennsylvania, first by only a few hundred votes, then by a couple of thousand votes. Although the AP and the networks continue to declare the race too close to call, it's Biden's turn to take to the cameras declaring victory. Trump insists by tweet and by microphone, this theft will not stand. We are taking back our victory. And so begins the saga over the disputed result of the 2020 presidential election. Not fraud, not foreign interference, the blue shift. The scenario that I just read to you was published in the Loyola University Chicago Law Journal by a constitutional scholar who will be on my CNN program with me today at the outset. His name is Ned Foley. He's been with me on CNN a couple of times and on my Sirius XM radio program. And he wrote, he wrote the scenario that I've just described, trying to wake people up to the fact that it's entirely possible that we go to bed on November 3rd, the final day of voting, believing one candidate has won the race, and then we wake up and learn that, no, we were only talking projections last night. Now we're talking about the certification process. And because of the president's complaints, concerns about fraud, and all his spinning pertaining to mail balloting, the, the predicate will have been laid for people to then think, oh, my God, everything President Trump said is true, and the race is in the process of being stolen. But what Professor Foley, the constitutional scholar, points out, and hopefully will explain this in my uh, program this morning, is that this is a natural consequence 
of a variety of factors, not the least of which is more people, especially Democrats, voting by mail. And so that it's really important to get the message out and let folks know that the blue shift is real and not necessarily indicative of fraud. In fact, through no malfeasance, this has been taking place for several election cycles. And it took place most notably in recent elections in the, uh, the uh, McSally Cinema Race in Arizona uh, and also in Florida, where DeSantis and Rick Scott won, but you know the margin was getting less and less and less. And of course, the complaint is, oh, they're stealing it, they're stealing it. But no, it's actually a natural consequence of the way in which we're voting. And it points to the difference between projections and certification. So I'm going to get into the blue shift this morning and to do so with the man who coined those words. Ned Foley is the professor who coined those words and has written about them and finally is now getting attention. Um, something I want to recommend to everybody today, and then, I will, and then I will tell you, it's related to that. It's related to that, and then I'll, I'll tell you with more specificity what else I'll be doing on television this morning. The post office. Uh, yesterday, I had on my CNN program the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, Kathy Bookvar, and we were talking about Pennsylvania in particular, and I discussed with her. In fact, um, I believe the audio is posted here on my Facebook page, but if not, I know it's in my Twitter feed. And TC will make sure that everybody knows where to find it. But I talked to her about the, the fact that the Postal Service had sent a letter to Pennsylvania and to a lot of other states and said, hey, we don't know that we're going to be able to count your ballots in time for November 3rd. And so Pennsylvania now is requesting its Supreme Court to allow the counting of ballots that are, that are postmarked by Election Day and that arrive within three days thereafter. Another reason why there could be a shift between the tabulation on election night and the final count, the certified count. Now, today's headlines are all about the Postal Service, and, and there's a narrative that is uh, unfolding, and I think that the Trump administration has, a, has done a poor job in defending itself against and the narrative is one of that the fix is in, that there are postal boxes being removed across the country, especially in the western states, and that it's being done, and, and that, and that the, the, the backlog of mail and so forth is, is all by design and intended to screw up deliberately the counting of all those Democratic mail-in ballots. I think that's a narrative that's emerging. Nobody is saying it in quite those terms, but that's the, that's the image you're getting from some of the media coverage. I would recommend, and it's posted or will be posted at smirconish.com uh, within the next 20 minutes. Uh, I would recommend, strongly recommend that you read today's Wall Street Journal lead editorial. The post office's problem the post office's problem isn't Trump. And, and the, the, the journal makes the argument today with facts and with data that what's going on in the Postal Service has been long in the making, that it is mostly due to significantly decreased volume because what? I mean, do we send letters? We send emails. We send texts. And so the volume has been rocked. The mail volume peaked in 2006 at 213 billion pieces. As of last year, it was down more than 33%. More than half of what remains is marketing mail. So mail is really becoming a thing of the past, and consequently, the Postal Service is uh, experiencing a significant drop in revenue. At the same time, and I really hadn't thought about this, I really hadn't focused on this until now, the delivery points that are serviced by the U.S. mail, the U.S. Postal Service, are increasing. They increased 9% from 146 million to 160 million in that same time period where I told you that the volume is down. So volume down, 
locations way the hell up. They're, in, it's in simple terms, fewer people are using the Postal Service, but there are far more addresses that need to be serviced. Interesting uh, uh, tidbits. This is, this is just in the, uh, the sort of shits and giggles category, but it makes the point that, you know, for 55 cents, by the way, did you even know that's the current stamp, 55 cents? I didn't. I didn't. I, I, I thought it was 45, um, which tells you how often I use the mail. The USPS says that its longest route is Sydney, Montana, where a carrier goes 191 miles a day to hit 272 mailboxes. In Supai, S-U-P-A-I, Arizona, mules take mail down an eight-mile path to the base of the Grand Canyon. I love that. Anyway, the Postal Service, look, I, I, I don't know if the new guy is, is running it into the ground or if he's trying to turn it around. I really don't know. I, I'm simply suggesting that I, I don't like what I see in the simplicity of the narratives that are being presented. Like, they're, they're, they're trashing the mail so the ballots don't get delivered. There are a lot of good folks working for the Postal Service who I'm convinced are not trashing the whole process so as to limit the vote by mail. But we need to be mindful that a lot of people are voting, you know, I'm one of them, are going to vote by mail in this cycle. It's going to put a strain on the Postal Service. They need to be ready. They need to be pro properly funded. And as I've been saying, both on radio and television, the vote count, unless it's a landslide, might not be what we're accustomed to, and we might not know the victor on election night or even for 24, 48, or more hours thereafter. So Ned Foley will be my guest, and we shall talk about the... Blue Shift, um, and as I say, that, uh, that, that publication that he wrote was in a scholarly journal. In fact, TC, would you help me and put embed in, in this uh, thread the Loyola University Chicago Law Journal, for those who really want to understand the Blue Shift, put it right in here so that people can, can see the data on which I'm relying. That would be great. Um, what else are we going to do today? We are going to talk about Kanye West. Kanye West. Uh, he's only on maybe four or five ballots. He met with Jared Kushner in Colorado last weekend. And I have Randall Lane from Forbes joining me on CNN today because Kanye West has spoken to him repeatedly, including one four-hour-long telephone conversation. I want to know, was he lucid? I mean, what's it like? What's it like to speak to ye for, uh, for four continuous hours? Um, I've not paid much attention to this subject thus far. Obviously, Kanye West is, is not going to be the next president of the United States. In fact, he won't be on enough ballots where even theoretically he could be the next president of the United States. But, but you know, in a race that's tight, might a sufficient number of voters cast their ballot for Kanye West and, and for whom would they otherwise have voted? The presumption is, well, Joe runs well with minority voters. Any voter for Kanye is not a voter for Joe. I don't know that I buy into that. But I do want to know more about Kanye West. So we'll do that today. This will be interesting. This will be interesting. Here, here is a headline... Here's a headline from today's USA Today. So Chicago has really had more than its fair share of unrest recently, including on the, I'll get it right this time because I love being there, magnificent mile. Sometimes I say miracle mile. Magnificent mile. Um, and the police superintendent, the police superintendent has said that he believes that the lack of prosecution of protest, not protesters, looters among the protesters, looters among the protesters, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, because Chicago had its share of looting, as did other cities then, the police superintendent, among others, has said the fact that they went easy on those who looted post 
killing of George Floyd is what caused this past Sunday night into Monday to occur. Kim Fox is the prosecutor, is the Cook County prosecutor, and she will join me and we will talk about whether lax prosecution in the past gave rise to the recent unrest in Chicago. That should be interesting. And then finally, pigskin politics. Uh, Robert Cahaley is a pollster with a pretty good track record. I think he was the only one to get Michigan right in the last cycle. And we will be here to talk about the political ramifications of the fact that some in, in the, uh, the five uh, most powerful conferences are playing and some are not. And how's that going to play politically? You know, how does it play politically? You've got, um, you've got no football in the Big Ten. That's the Midwest. You've got no football in the Pac-12. That's the West Coast. You will have football, at least as things stand now, in the SEC, that's the Southeast, in the Big 12, that's the Great Plains, and in the ACC, that's the East Coast. So when the folks in the Midwest aren't getting their football and they're looking, say, at the Southeast and they are getting their football, who are they blaming for that, if anyone politically? Is that a factor in the 2020 election, the lack of football in some parts of the country? I'm going to explore that subject, the survey question today at Smirconish.com. We've done it for radio, but now we're going to do it for the television audience. Should college football be played in the fall? Should college football be played in the fall? That's the survey question. So the blue shift with, with a constitutional scholar, the man who coined those words, Ned Foley, um, the Kanye factor with someone who has spent a great deal of time interviewing him recently, the uh, Chicago unrest with the Cook County prosecutor, and pigskin politics with a uh, pollster who is focused on exactly that issue. That is what I've got going on today. Let me just see if there's anything else that I wanted to say. And I, and I, and I want to recommend the Wall Street Journal. You know, unfortunately, they have a paywall. Um, it'll be in my newsletter today. But if you don't have access to the journal, I can't much help you with that. But I've given, you the, I've given you the gist of it. Volume down, addresses up, postal service struggling before there was a 2020 election. That's the takeaway from the journal. And they say, you can't just lay this off on Trump, even if Trump doesn't want people voting by mail and ballot. So, by the way, the links are up on the website uh, now. If you've, if you've not registered for my daily newsletter, please do. It's, it's free. And the premise is that I get up really early and read in, and I narrow the focus of what I'll be discussing on radio or television that day, put those links on my website, and then we send them off so that when you wake up, you know, there they are to start your day. At least, at least it's the benefit of my read-in. And one thing that you will find is that there is, is, um, there is great um, selection, great uh, variety in the outlets. I'm not giving you GOP talking points only. I'm not giving you uh, Democratic talking points only. I'm giving you both. And, and don't judge me based on any one day. Judge me based on a week. You know, look, look at what I constantly uh, am generating and see what you think. Um, all right. Brenda, you say Miracle Mile too? Oh, good. Now you're putting it in my head. Denise, college football shouldn't be played. Luis, you like the newsletter? Thank you for that. What about the UAE and Israel, says Ken. I think it's terrific. I mean, look, when Tom Friedman, who is no supporter of the president, says this is huge, and, and he is such a, uh, a student uh, of Israeli and Middle Eastern politics, then then I think you've got you've to take note. When this news broke, and I was on radio, and TC read to me a headline, and she said, hey, there's breaking news. UAE and Israel are doing a deal, uh, and it's going, to stop the, um, um, it's going to stop the further, uh, what's the word that I want to use? The settlements will no longer be annexed. I said, it's too late. 
as one who has traveled there, albeit not for a period of years, I, I thought there'd been too much settlement activity to ever make a two-state possibility real. Maybe I was wrong. I would love to think that I was wrong. I also think that it shows that Netanyahu is really on the ropes because this is, this is a total reversal of what Netanyahu has been trying to do to keep himself in power by relying on, on the ultra-conservative settlers and telling them that he had their back. Uh, Edward says, uh, uh, Kim Fox, isn't she the one who wouldn't prosecute Jesse Smollett? Jesse Smollett. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Not my focus in, in today's conversation, but I think very relevant on background. Really relevant on background. Lee, we are, need, we are in deep if, if whether they play football could determine the outcome of the election. I, I mean, I hear you. I, I hear you. I just... I just think that sometimes we get caught up here in the very front page and like the UAE and, and Israel and, and some of you are asking me questions, what about the UAE and Israel and, and what's that going to do to Trump, blah, 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 blah. I'd love to think that American voters are making up their minds based on whether there's a Middle East peace proposal that really could fly. Frankly, I think more will be drawn emotionally by how they're feeling by not getting their football on Saturdays. Just saying. Uh, Marlis, he doesn't deserve a trophy for the UAE thing. Too early to tell. I don't, know, I don't know where it goes. I don't know where it goes. Can't even turn on lights in New York City on 9-11. I mean, because of the, uh, the rolling blackouts? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Hard for me to keep up with all you guys. I'm trying, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> okay, and I'm reading a lot of your comments. Biden loses if no football, says Cindy. I don't know if he loses because of no football, but I think he needs to start taking questions. Like I get the rollout with Kamala and, and I get how they wanted it to be smooth. And so, you know, they were appeared side by side day one, then they signed their papers day two. But I, I think, uh, even in the pandemic, I think he's going to have to come out to play a little bit more. So, I should be golfing this weekend, says Craig. How do you know that I won't be? I actually won't be. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I really appreciate it. Share, will you do me a favor? Share this, uh, my opening commentary with a friend, because I I'm on a mission to, I feel a responsibility with my multiple platforms to inform people that the delayed vote counting is not indicative of fraud if it is delayed. And, and to, to sort of educate people that because so many are voting by mail this cycle. Do you know that in my home state of, of uh, Pennsylvania, 5% used to vote absentee. It could be 50% or more in this cycle. So common sense says it's a new system <clears throat> and it could take longer to count the ballots. That doesn't mean the race is being stolen. I laid that out at the beginning of this commentary. So if you would share this with a friend, uh, I would be much obliged. All right. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you being tuned in. I'm going to uh, go get my noggin powdered and I hope to see you at 9 a.m. on CNN. Wear a mask. See ya.